I want to move right into the Word of God shortly, but in a very brief but sincere way, I'd like to offer my gratitude for the congregation here, for the eldership here, for those involved in the school of preaching, and whomever may have had uh, a hand in inviting me to come and participate in uh, this joyous occasion. I uh, thank you sincerely, and it is an honor to be able to be here today and to uh, participate in this wonderful lectureship. I made a phone call not long ago, maybe a year and a half or so ago, maybe two years now, I don't remember exactly, to a brother in Christ. Many of you knew Brother William Woodson. And Brother Woodson was very ill at the time. And I called him. He and I had been friends for a number of years. And there was a last phone call that we had. He passed away shortly after that. And the last words that he said to me were the words, I love you, brother. What a wonderful statement to be able to hear and to be able to return to this servant in Christ. I love you, brother. Christian love, brotherly love is a subject that we're privileged to take a few moments this morning and look at. As we consider it, the question becomes, why is it so important? Why should we spend time this morning looking at the subject of Christian love? All we have to do is look around us in the world. And we can see how from a worldly standpoint that people's attitudes and actions so often fail to portray any kind of love, unfortunately. And sometimes a very limited or guarded love. But when you look at the faithful child of God, you see a life whose words, actions, attitude, and demeanor are far removed from those actions. And you can see the outcome of one on one side and one on the other. You can see the outcome of the worldly attitude and how sad it is influencing our society. But yet you can look at the child of God faithful to His Word, and you can see how marvelous an influence that it has in our world. But also, you may look at God's Word and find readily the importance of the subject as God looks at it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, obviously this is a chapter that uh, we're going to devote some time to. Right in the middle of two chapters on either side, 12 and 14, you find a discussion of spiritual gifts. And people in that day and time had a marvelous attraction for those spiritual gifts. And if we had been in that day and time, we likely would have had a great fascination with them as well. We do when we read of them in Scripture. But right in the middle of that, we find this marvelous subject of love presented. In verse 13, now abideth faith. Hope, charity, which is love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. In verse 8, love never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. But he says love will last. Above all things, put on love, Colossians 3 and verse 14. That's quite a statement when you have love brought up and exalted to that extent in the Word of God. In Mark 12 and verse 29, the first of all commandments, as he continues in those verses, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And then he follows up in the second, he's likened to it, love thy neighbor as thyself. And on and on we can go and give examination to passages in God's Word 
that exalt this marvelous subject of love. But there's three areas I want to consider this morning as we look at this subject matter. First, love's derivation. Now Webster, as he defines that word, says to take, receive, or obtain, especially from a specified source. To obtain, actually or theoretically, from a parent substance. Now basically what we're looking at there is a source. And as we examine the creation around us, and as we examine the Word of God, we come under the conclusion that the source of love is God. None other. God Himself. He that loveth not knoweth not God. God is love. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. Now there are many attributes in relation to the love of God. But just to mention a few to remind us of such. Number one, giving. In a familiar passage in John chapter 3 and verse 16. The Bible says... For God so loved the world that He gave. He gave His only begotten Son. We can't even begin to imagine what transpired in that action. The very fact of Jesus leaving heaven. We think about the cross and we think about the sacrifice of the cross. But think about the sacrifice of just leaving heaven itself. When you find yourself in a marvelous and wondrous setting in life, have you ever heard yourself think in your mind, you know, I wish this would last forever. I don't want to leave here. I want to stay here. But heaven, we've never seen anything near. And I can promise you, the faithful who get there, They're never going to want to leave. But Jesus willingly left. God willingly gave that son. And of course the cross. We can't begin to imagine when Jesus was on that cross and the sins of the world came upon him and the father turned away from him. God so loved the world that he gave. But forgiveness. In Jeremiah chapter 31 As God talks about himself and as he talks about the covenant and he looks forward to the time in which this marvelous circumstance will become a reality, he talks about his word being in the hearts of men and then he says, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. When we consider ourselves even at our very best, It's a sad circumstance. If you remember in Romans chapter 5. In Romans 5, the Bible has a great discussion there. But one of the things among that discussion are four phrases that are used as descriptive terms of us as mankind. In that passage, he tells us that God gave his only son for us. But In what circumstance are we in as that son is given? Well, in verse 6, he says, without strength. God gave his son for that we may obtain forgiveness when we were without strength. We were without strength to do anything for ourselves. We could in no way take and act anything in and of ourselves that would save us or give us any hope. While we were in that condition, God offered his son for our forgiveness. In verse 6, he also says, ungodly. Well, that doesn't, I, that doesn't sound good, you know. We don't normally appreciate someone that looks at us and says, as far as mankind, mankind's ungodly. But God said that through inspiration. And in those circumstances, he gave his son. You move on down to verse 8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Another Uh, descriptive term that is very bold and very sobering. But then when you move down to verse 10, he uses the word enemies. While we were enemies with God, God gave His only begotten Son that we may have forgiveness. The marvelous love of God. Well, long-suffering comes into play. In uh, 2 Peter, rather, chapter 3 and verse 9, 
The Bible states, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That long-suffering of God. How many times have you found yourself in a circumstance into which you realize that you had done wrong, whether it was intentionally, whether it was unintentionally, and you realize that maybe for a period of time there, you had been in the wrong, and you stopped and you asked for forgiveness, and you thought about the long-suffering of God, whether it was a day or a week or a month, the long-suffering of God was there for you and for me. Compassion. In Psalms chapter 86 and verse 15, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion. And we could go on concerning these attributes of God's love, and we sit and we marvel at them. That's the source of love. This is where love comes from. It comes from God Himself. And of course, that love is supremely manifested in the giving of His Son. In this was manifest the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9. And we must remember that this love given from God was not because we earned it in any way, nor that we deserved it in any way. But the magnificent love of God extended it to us. So that, that source is of great importance. It's a, of great importance for, for many reasons. But one thing we need to remember is that when we start thinking about what is love? How should I love? How should I enact love in my life? Well, you go back to the source. And you see what the source does and how the source handles things and how the source teaches us to handle it. And then we can love as God calls for us to love. But secondly, let's consider, uh, for lack of better terminology, love's definition. Let's consider a little bit concerning this particular word as we find especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now in our English language we have the word love. Unfortunately, that word has been used to describe everything from the most honorable of emotions to the most depraved actions of men. And people want to take the word love and they want to tack it on just any and every action that they feel suitable. Even things that are horrible, they want to say love. And they want to take the word love and they want to excuse away anything. And sometimes people find themselves involved in horrible things, despicable things in the sight of God, but they want to hold on to that word love, and they want to say, well, God is love, so uh, it really doesn't matter. I was with one of my elders, and we were visiting with a couple, and we had a very serious matter that we had to discuss with them based upon the Bible. And... The circumstance came down to where they, they didn't appreciate the Word of God as we lovingly presented it. But finally, the man made a statement that just, uh, I'm glad I was sitting down because I probably would have fallen down. But in this particular circumstance, we were showing them uh, what the Bible taught on something, and the man looked at us and he said, you know, I believe exactly what you're saying about that passage. I believe that passage says and means just exactly what you're saying and prove that it means. I said, I just don't think God's going to hold us accountable for it. But people say, God is love. How could God ask me to change here? How could God ask me to give up this circumstance in which I'm living? How could God ask me to make such a dramatic change in my life? Because He is God and He knows what is best. And it's through His love that He calls for change in our life for the better. Love does not overlook those things that are wrong and disorderly. Love calls for us to come out of it and shows us how to come out of it. One man said, when a word begins to mean everything, it soon means nothing. 
And we find that, unfortunately, with this word now. When you look over to the Greek language, you will find three words for love, one of which is not as found in the Bible. You find uh, eros, that which is not uh, found, phileo, and agape. Now, of course, the eros deals with the romantic sexual love. But you move on, you find phileo, which is a friendly love motivated by common interest and goals. But the one that I'm interested in as we look at our study today is that word agape, which is a self-giving, sacrificial love. It is a love that has the best interest of others as a motivating force. Now that right off the bat flies in the face of much we see in the world today as far as people's attitudes. Because selfishness permeates our society. And you find so often that people have little interest, if any at all, as far as others' welfare or their well-being. People are so busy caught up in self. What they can do for self how they can get this for self or get that gain for self or promote self. And that's far from this agape love. Now let's look for a few moments at some phrases and uh, I don't have the time obviously this morning to get into all of the aspects of it but just to give us an overview here. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 starting with verse 4. There are a number of phrases given here in recognition of love, and I want to examine just a little bit of this tie that binds God together with each other, with us and each other and Him. First of all, love suffers long. It doesn't give a quick retort. It's not in a hurry to strike back at something. Some people, as they exhibit themselves in life, seem almost like a snake that is coiled and ready to strike at any given moment, at anyone concerning any matter. Well, that, that, that is not what he's talking about. Here. He's talking about love suffers long. Love is not quick to strike back. Love is not looking for any given circumstance where it can take and lash out at someone. It suffers long. Where would we be? Any of us, myself, first and foremost, or any of us, where would we be if God did not suffer long? Where would we be if God would strike immediately or even shortly after we sinned against Him? We would have no hope if it were not for the long suffering of God. Then he says, love is kind. It manifests itself in mildness and pleasantness. It doesn't have this sharp or bitter uh, dealing with other people. Now when people walk away from us, after someone's had a conversation with us, or someone has been around us uh, involved in an activity, when they walk away from us, do they feel kindness being exhibited to them? We need to ask ourselves that. And it may be good at times for us to do an evaluation of self. And when we've been with someone that we know or maybe someone that we've just met, when you walk away, sometime try to remember. Now, following this conversation or following this action with these people, did they walk away? Did I conduct myself so when they walked away, they felt kindness from me? Because he says love does that. Love is kind. Love envieth not. The idea of this verb is to be moved with envy, hatred, or anger. Are we satisfied or are we a selfish people? Selfishness is at the core of so many things that fly against biblical teaching on love. And our world, unfortunately, has too much of it. But he says, love envieth not. He said, is not puffed up. One does not bear themselves loftily or in a wrongful, proud, and arrogant manner. For an individual to handle themselves in such a way is not to exhibit Christian love as the Bible teaches. Now, obviously, there are times when 
in a proper way, we're to be proud of maybe an accomplishment we've done. But there's a difference between being thankful in a manner of such nature and having an arrogance in which we hold ourselves as though we are better than everyone else for some excuse or another. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave unseemly. Now this term unseemly uh, means to use unbecoming form or behavior to act dishonorably or to be rude. Well that rude, it seems like sometimes some people have made a fine art out of being rude. And it's almost as though there is no direction or angle that you can come from to try to encourage and help these people, but they have it cut off with a rude response. Well, how about us? What about if it's something that someone says to us that is not of a favorable nature to us? Maybe it just doesn't rub us right, as we say. How do we respond? How do we respond if someone says something to us or maybe about us and maybe it's not too good? How do we respond? What if someone just, as we would say, flat out lies about us? How do we respond? You see, this idea of uh, not behaving unseemly, this goes for the times when someone would just lie about us. Or do something intentionally harmful to us. It applies in those circumstances as well. It's not all that hard, or it shouldn't be, for us to reply in a favorable manner, in in a a conscientious manner of, of our Christianity when someone is dealing good with us. But what about the other times? Do we have a license to be rude if someone is rude to us? Well, certainly not. Love seeks not her own. This is the idea of insisting on having one's own way regardless of the need and interest of others. Have you ever seen someone that they just had to have their way? And I realize we have all these personalities. We have type A and and all of these things. And I wonder sometimes if that isn't used sort of as a front for someone to push their own way. Well, certainly, if someone is in the wrong, they don't need to be pushing that way, and they need to change. But what do we do if we're right on a matter, and and what we're looking at can be a good and helpful thing? Do we push that? Do we steamroll that over other people? You know, there are times when something can be good, can accomplish good results, but yet it may not be right in the circumstances because of the feelings of others. I'm not talking about uh, compromising doctrine in any way. Absolutely not. But just if you have circumstances and, and you have an idea and yours is a good idea, but people around you say, well, we'd rather go this other way on it and it would be okay to go that way. How do we handle that? How do we deal with it? Love is not easily provoked. This is the idea of losing one's temper or being irritable or, as we would call it, flying off the handle. How do we control ourselves? Do we have that hair trigger? Are we quick to fly off the handle if something doesn't go our way or someone doesn't say something uh, the way we think it should be said or act as the way we think they should act? Even if someone wrongs us, even if someone stands right in front of us and speaks wrongfully to us, do we have the right to fly off the handle then? You see, we have to be careful even as Christians that we don't have areas that we corral love in, but it's to cover in every circumstance. Thinks no evil. The idea is that it never imputes evil motives with a view towards one's evaluation of the motives of others. Have you ever had someone that it seemed like they said, I'll forgive you, but then they filed it away? And they were ready at any given point in time to bring that out and bring it to your remembrance. Hmm. 
How do we handle things when we forgive? Thinks no evil. Do we give the best toward circumstances? We'll look at that in a little moment, uh, few moments as well. Rejoices not in iniquity. Is never glad when someone else does wrong. I wonder sometimes if we're not careful if Satan doesn't try to get into our lives on this and use this as a circumstance that if someone else does wrong, this is our opportunity to put our hands on their head and to push them down so that we can seemingly elevate ourselves. That's not biblical love. Biblical love never calls for us to take someone else on the head and push them down in order to elevate ourselves. We should be concerned if they're in the wrong and try to help them. Try to help them to realize it in a loving way for their soul's sake. He says rejoices in truth. One who rejoices in that which is right and true. Do we do that if it's not necessarily like we want it? Something can be true and right, but there's another way that could be good too, and we want it that way. Wah, wah, wah. I wanted it my way. The church needs encouragement. And when things are right and good, we need to encourage in those things. Love, he says, bears all things. It holds back from exposing or from creating difficulty by hastily and ill-considered action. In other words, blowing the lid off. There are times when love calls for us to, as it were, hold things in. Maybe we have to hold it in for a while and the circumstance gets worked out. Maybe we have to hold it in in love for someone else's reputation or the church. Sometimes it may be something that has to be held in for a lifetime. You know, I don't envy our loving elders in the Lord's church. We as preachers are able to be involved with them in certain aspects of the work, not as an elder, by the way, but just as working companions in the church. And we are able to see some of the circumstances in which they have to deal with. And there are loads that they have on them that, oh, their day could be so much better if they could unload that and get it off. But they lovingly bear it because they want to be a faithful servant to God. What a magnificent love. Love believes all things. It's always eager to believe the best. How often do we see that? When you look in the world, do you see people trying to give the best light possible on circumstances until, you know, maybe it's proven that it's not good? When the facts aren't clear, how do we respond? If we hear some sort of uh, gossip, and we're not sure whether that's true or not. How do we handle that? Should we be listening at all to begin with? You see, gossip has a hard time traveling if there's no avenue whereby it can continue to travel. But what if people gave us that type of consideration? What if people thought something or, or something, someone said something or misunderstood something about us, and the next thing you know, people are wondering where we stand or what we did or would we want them to give the best possible light on the circumstances until they find out the facts on it? Well, certainly we would. Well, that's what love does. Love hopes all things. The idea is that love is always hopeful. It never despairs. There's a lot of things in the world today that could, could bring despair upon us. But as we learn love from the Word of God, we're better able to handle those things as they come to us. Love endures all things. It remains steadfast to the end while bearing matters of difficulty in a brave and calm manner. It's a challenge. It's a challenge to be an enduring individual. Sometimes it may help if we use our hindsight as we term it. Because there are times when we face seemingly insurmountable foes. Or there's a circumstance there that we're having to deal with and it seems so challenging and so hard. Look back. Because you know, that's probably not the only time in our life that we have faced challenging and difficult circumstances. And if we look back 
and we handle those circumstances as God would have us to handle them, then we can learn from that because we'll be able to look back and see the hand of God blessing us and His handiwork. So sometimes we need to look back and we need to see from experiences in the past how that indeed God works in the lives of His faithful people. And may these things encourage us so that as we face circumstances now or in the future, that we can look back and say, you know, God has always been with me as long as I was faithful to Him. And He is going to help me in this circumstance as well. Love endures all things. But then he says, love never fails. It holds out for the triumph of right over wrong. God is always right. His ways are always right, and He is always victorious. His love shows that, and may we learn from that. Thirdly, and we, we could have spent a lot of time on that second point, but I want to mention this third point as well, and that is love's demand. Sometimes, if we're not careful, and we maybe have a little bit of a tweaked idea about love. If we're not careful, Satan can help us to entertain the thoughts that, you know, if God loves me, as the Bible proves he loves me, then I'm just going to sit back and be thankful for that. And we sort of ease up and maybe even have a little idea of apathy creeping in on us. But far from relieving a person from the need of heeding details. In other words, looking and saying, okay, what does God expect of me here? What does God expect of me there? Love demands action. It demands action. It's not a passive thing where we just sit back and, and we just enjoy this marvelous thing. Now, we do. And if we don't enjoy the love of God, then maybe we need to rethink that and look at the scriptures and appreciate that more but love demands action a couple of things quickly love demands action toward God on our part Jesus said if you love me keep my commandments John 14 and verse 15 so love then calls for us to keep the commandments of God and if we're not keeping the commandments of God, how can we say that we love God? John 14 and verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. We need to be encouraged that as we do the will of God, when people want to sit back and say, Well, you, you folks are, are sticklers. If we're being faithful in keeping the word of God, it shows our love toward God. The love of God is in keeping His commandments. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3, For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. One of the reasons I believe that His commandments are not grievous is because of the great love that He has shown for us and exhibited unto us. And how could we but respond and say, Whatever you ask, I'm willing to do because I love you. And this is love that we walk after his commandments, 2 John 6. The one who has his commandments and keeps them has fellowship with God. We're told in John chapter 14 and verse 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. Secondly, John 15 and verse 10 along this same line, If ye keep my commandments... Ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept the Father's commandments and abide in His love. That's a fellowship issue there. Having fellowship with God, we must show that love. Love demands proper actions on our part toward God in keeping His commandments. But secondly, love demands action toward our fellow man. There has to be action exhibited to our fellow man if we have love as the Bible teaches we mentioned the first great commandment, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. But the second, like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. Mark chapter 12 and verse 31. 
So it's more than just God and us. It is God, us, and our fellow man. One of our speakers at Highland in this last summer series that we had was a marvelous series. He was speaking, and I believe his phrase applies to this. Our fellow man must see love, as he termed it, with skin on it. Not just some word they hear people talking about, but with skin on it. They see it in our lives. That we exhibit it toward them. They see it manifested as God's love was manifested in the giving of His Son. That our love is manifested toward our fellow man through our actions and our words and our demeanor. And they may see it and they may know it. Love demands action toward each other as Christians. One of the most cold-hearted things is one who professes to be a Christian but does not love his brother. We're told in 1 John 4 and verse 20, If a man say, I love God and hate his brother, he is a liar. Now that's what God says about it. That's a serious, serious statement. If you say you love your brother or you love God and you don't love your brother, God says you're a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? We're told also in 1 John 4 and verse 21, this is a commandment that we have from him, that he that loveth God love his brother also. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one for another. John 13 and verse 35. It is a badge of discipleship. There are other things, or times getting away. Uh, it is supreme, 1 Peter 4 and verse 8. It must be practiced to prevent our stumbling. If you don't want to stumble, work to build this Christian love in your life. It denotes divine sonship. The children of God are manifest through this, 1 John 3 and verse 10. It, it examples, it evidences one who has come from spiritual death to spiritual life. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14. And we are to love in deed and in truth. 1 John 3 and verse 18. This is just, as we say, touching the hem of the garment of the subject. But I hope that as we have looked at these three particular matters this morning, it's encouraged us concerning this marvelous subject. How beautiful and how marvelous is the love which our Heavenly Father has bestowed upon us. And may we seek to emulate that love, that he may be glorified, that our unity as Christians in the church may be in order, and that the world may be brought to him through us. Thank you for your time.